Welcome back to Yar 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. I'm your host, Mike Salitro, and today we are thrilled to be speaking with Jerry Fu. Jerry is a conflict resolution coach who helps Asian American leaders initiate and navigate difficult conversations so that they can experience clarity, confidence, and closure. Jerry, welcome. We are really happy to be speaking with you. Hey, Mike. Happy to be here. Excellent. Great. Uh, I want to start with difficult conversations. I don't meet a lot of people who look forward to them, who have experience with them, who want to talk about them after they happen. So how did you decide, this is what I want to do? <laughs> yeah, uh, we joke sometimes, right? Sometimes things don't, th we don't choose things, they choose us, right? And um, I suppose the reason it ended up being my focus was that I realized this was the one factor that was holding me back from becoming an effective leader uh, because what a lot of novice leaders uh, need to struggle with and ultimately get past is to trade popularity for respect and I was so used to just being liked and it works as a teammate right oh Jerry is so easy to get along with everybody everybody likes Jerry until you have to hold people accountable and uh, whenever work goes south you realize okay well I can't just stay likable I have to you know, go in there, do some digging and figure out exactly what happened and address and invite the person to help make sure that broken expectation doesn't happen again. Um, from other standpoints, though, I'll give a specific example. Uh, for example, uh, one of my early clients, her boss was passive aggressive. He tried calling her while she was at dinner with friends. She didn't pick up. And the next day, she, he just blows up at her. It's like, how dare you? That was disrespectful. I don't care what. I need you for it doesn't matter how urgent it is if I need you I need you and I don't think you're committed to this job and she calls me on a late Thursday night and she goes how in the world um, do I try to get things kind of back to normal without possibly hitting more tripwires and possibly getting fired right because you don't know maybe this guy blows a gasket you don't know what kind of mine you can step on and, and then lose the job and she's like you know i do have an exit strategy but i need a couple more paychecks before i'm able to like bow out gracefully so how do i have a conversation with him that kind of gets things back to a tolerable point and so we walked her through you know hey well what exactly would this successful conversation be like step one right um are you looking for an apology are you looking for clear expectations do you want cleaner edges on the boundaries of saying hey you know anytime you call uh, you know, I might be in a family emergency and that's not disrespectful, is it? Well, no. It's like, okay, well then, you know, how can we make sure he doesn't misinterpret uh, your actions? Um, then the second step was to walk her through, well, you know, you're going to have to initiate this. Uh, and I tell people I'm conflict averse. Like I still, you know, you're, you, I've built up this habit for so many years. Uh, it, you can't just unlearn that, but you can compensate for it if, with the right system right and so the second step for all of you conflict diverse people out there and i'm with you it is 10 seconds of courage and 10 seconds of courage to say hey you don't have to be a superhero just be a superhero for 10 seconds can you pick up that phone can you send that text can you dial that phone number and uh set the ball in motion lock the gate behind you so you can't backtrack or procrastinate or you know rationalize because that's what we all love doing uh and so um, from there, we said, okay, well, let's script your critical phrases, right? Let's let's say, what do you want to exactly say? Organize that on paper. Anticipate the pushback he's going to say to each of those things, and then get ready to counter the problem. Um, and then from there, we said, okay, step four, rehearse, and then step five, follow through. And so to come back to the original question, right, uh, you realize, uh, you know, like, if I'm struggling with this, surely I'm not the only one, and uh, I just want to be able to give my clients a, a bigger voice a bolder voice when it comes to realizing hey you know what i don't have to be afraid of this or even if i am i can still do something that's a i really like that answer for multiple reasons and i want to follow up on and all those points there the, the first being that um you mentioned at the end that we all have the difficult conversations even if we're not fans of them most of us and even if we don't want to relive them there's something that we all kind of face so being able to have that kind of five point strategy you go over is really helpful and what that story illustrates is that you you know most of us say well why would anybody want to work for that person why would they just leave well you identify that's not realistic they you know they have an exit strategy but they're not there yet and then secondly what is the ultimate goal and how can you work backwards so have have 
successful outcome in mind and how can we get there and what would that look like? So I think that's, that's really useful because we're all going to face difficult conversations and, and kind of where you started there. We all like to be liked by everybody, get along well, but when you find yourself in that leadership, that management, the t- team lead role, it's, well, uh, something has happened or is going to happen shortly thereafter. So I'm going to have to have a, uh, at least a plan for this. Yeah. Do you, do you see a lot of people either that you work with or in your workplaces that kind of go from being that likable, that high achieving team member to a role where they are now in charge of that team. And, uh, this, this is not what I expected, or I'm going to just keep doing the things that I did and it's not working. Please help me, Jerry. Is that, is that, <laughs> that common? Oh, I got a good reason. I got a fresh raw example for you, Mike. All right. Well, so yeah, we recently hired a, a new technician out for, for those of you who don't know, my day job is a, it's a pharmacy manager and it's less about the vocation as opposed to just the kind of dynamics you have. And so one of my more seasoned experienced technicians who is a classic, like conflict diverse, like I just want to, you know, get along with everyone. Please don't make me initiate anything difficult or awkward. Um, You know, she was visibly frustrated by this new hire because the new hire was, you know, seemed to be really shy and exceedingly passive when it came to just trying to learn the ropes and and get everything going. And so, you know, she and my other seasoned technician pulled me aside or I pulled them aside. We talked through this and it's just like, okay, uh, you know, what's going on? They said, well, you know, she's not meeting expectations. She's not stepping up. It's like, okay, well, you know, how, how do you want this conversation to go? Right. And so it took us a while to get the right angle. And so everyone ultimately, my secret is that everyone borrows from Dale Carnegie's playbook. Like we're all just doing variations on that because I had to kind of talk them through, well, you know, what angle are you comfortable engaging this conversation with? And finally, right, uh, when we came across a more gentle approach to say, hey, here's the standard. Here's why it's awesome. And here's why we like it. We want you to be able to meet that standard. What support do you need from us? Right. And so when you when you come in with an angle of, hey, here's where you are, or here's where we need you to be, here's where you are. How can we help you get there? Right. It it's a lot easier for people pleasing people to uh, you know, engage in what they would think is normally difficult. Will it work every time? No. But in this case, right, we had to get them to realize because they didn't have official titles, right? But we, as some consulting people say, we we believe in the concept of leaders at every level, right? Regardless of the title. So they were in a leadership role, even without a title. And so how do we get them to process? Okay, how how do we come in? How do we get them to angle themselves and position themselves as someone supportive and not like, you know, uh, coercive or, you know, light that fire right and sometimes that works but not in the long term i like that leaders at every level because it gives you the the practice or the the preparation that you need that when this is becomes real or when this is something that you can't avoid you do have some reps and it's it's kind of that mindset that you you build up so i think that that's a smart strategy and shouting out dale carnegie is is a good move because you're right that a lot of you know, the frameworks the the coaching strategies we see out there they are uh, remixes or updates from things in the past. And I, I like to joke, I was like, the dirty secret about a lot of these strategies, besides them being borrowed and uh, evolutions of others, they mostly all the time work. But mm-hmm. what, what you bring up, and you didn't say it exactly, but you you talked about it, is that you need to make it not only your own, but you need to make it real for the person that you're working with and kind of form, and formulate it to what, what their situation is dictates and what will work for the people involved because the people go wrong is one they put in kind of a half the effort don't really understand what they're talking about or two it's this is a one size fits all this is generic and it's just going to work and that doesn't work either uh, so you've you've obviously had success by uh, working with people and preparing them for for their next leadership role if they haven't got there yet or uh, teaching them here are the fundamentals here's what's going to happen here's how it can be tailored to your situation um, we talked a little bit before we hit record that I, I like the uh, the alliteration, the clarity, the confidence, and the closure. Uh, is there one that you find to prioritize over the other? Do they come together, or is it just that the uh, they sounded good putting them in the <laughs> sentence there? No, I mean, well, it, it, that's a great question, right? Because let's unpack this. Like, what is it if we're going to emphasize one thing over any other? Um, 
you know, you can't really because like all three of them work together. But if you were going to focus on one, it is closure simply because of this. I'll give an example because we love examples. Uh, so one of my other clients, uh, this is a fun one. He, you know, at at his church small group saw a girl he wanted to ask out. So he asked around. She was nice enough to give give him her number, and uh, he tries calling her a couple times, and it goes to voicemail, and she doesn't respond. And then then he does some research online and finds out she turns out she already has a boyfriend. And right, it's like, oh, well, you know, of course he's all, of course he's understandably upset. And then you know he's like, how do I handle this, right? And you know he's obviously a you know, trying to struggling to figure out what's the angle to take, how to, you know, what kind of story is actually going on here. And so we coached him through, yeah, what exactly do you need to say? So there's the clarity. Okay, well, what exactly are you going to say? How are you going to say it? Right. And then it's like, okay, do you have confidence? Do you believe, do you believe in what, and what you're about to say that, because if you don't believe it, like, it doesn't matter, like how great the words are, you can't, you know, say, if you don't believe in what you're saying, then don't say it. Right. Uh, but the closure he got, so to, to close the loop on that story, yeah, it turns out, you know, she just didn't like conflict either, right? She didn't like letting guys down when they, you know, want to reward their courage and uh, you know, just thought that was the easiest way to just kind of get him to stop bugging her for his her number, I guess. And then, so, you know, once he said, when he realized, well, of course, like, don't, don't just give me your number just to indulge me. Like, if you're honestly spoken for, like, please tell me so I, you're not wasting my time or yours, right? And so, you know, he calls me later. He's like, oh, like, I'm just so relieved. Like, just, you can hear the exhale, like, over the phone, just being like, oh, I'm so glad. The, the relief is is better than any kind of comfort zone you could stay in because the resentment is just unbearable after a while. That's what people like me, you know, realize. They're just like, well, you know, I don't want to be resentful, but after enough situations where I just kind of have to act like, well, it's not such a big a deal. And then at some point the gasket just flies off and then people are like, what happened? And it's like, yeah, you just, you just, you let the resentment build up. So in this case, I would say, yeah, the closure is the most important part because that is the most gratifying. And that's a, that's, that's really good example of why closure is important. And I, I wrote down a few things that I, I want to follow up. Um, First, it's amazing he, she gave him the right number because most of the time it's easy <laughs> yeah. to get, just give the wrong number and kind of that's the that's the yeah, right. uh, <laughs> but um, that very rarely is is there kind of a line of demarcation good versus bad or you know people are just terrible to each other. It's there is conflict here because she was trying to avoid a another situation. She didn't necessarily um, you know was not looking to start a conflict. Was like this is easier for me just to, to give you this and try to avoid by telling instead of having this conversation. And then instead, it made the car, it made it a lot worse because now he feels terrible. He's done. He's like, "What's going on here?" Uh, and then you, we started this by saying the the closure piece is most important. That's where people want to end up. You know, a lot of times, you know, you you do you follow the right steps, you have a good process, but the results not there. So if you can keep both of those things in mind, your outcome being positive is. is of higher likelihood. So uh, that story kind of illustrates that, that I'm sure he was not thrilled to be involved in any part of it, but having a better than terrible outcome is, is kind of the closure he was looking for. Uh, I, along with the, you know, difficult conversations and, and kind of conflict, uh, conflict is another one of those terms and all those things that people will try to avoid going back to people pleasing. Is there a way that you've seen I don't say looking for conflict to to make a situation better, but to proactively avoid a situation before it gets to this point or to have indicators that say, before we kind of go off the rail, either as a leader or as a teammate that say, you know, I, I know where this can go. Here's what we can do now to avoid that situation. Have you seen that? And if so, um, what kind of experiences have you had? Yeah, yeah. Um, part of it is just normalizing the the, the conversation around preventive measures, right? Like I, we had a group meeting, a big group meeting for all our team a couple of months ago and said, all right, we got a team meeting. And then immediately, right, the first instinct, someone said this and they're like, are we in trouble? And I said, no, this is the meeting to make sure you don't get in trouble. And then everything, everything, and then, then like the tech to just like deflated, right? <laughs> uh, I, I think about, you know, my best friend from college, we have a really strong relationship, obviously, because we've stayed in touch since college. And um, I think part of it is, like you said, it's preventive maintenance is just, okay, what are some ground rules to make sure that uh, disagreements don't happen? It's like, okay, listen without interrupting, right? And it's and that's not even something we have to emphasize because we're just good 
and we just like listening to each other without interrupting, right? It's just a matter of like, just getting in the habit of letting people finish talking. Um, and then, you know, when something does escalate, right? It's like, well, why are, you know, why are we so hung up on this? So we start to kind of get curious about like, where is this tension coming from? Is it just like some deep seated conviction you have and you know, what shape that? And then just recognizing, hey, you know, is this fight really worth losing the friendship over? It's like, well, no. It's like, okay, well, you know, can we just, can we just agree to disagree and then move on and go back to enjoy being friends with each other? Uh, and I realize it doesn't always, you know, sometimes that, that's the impasse that really just shows you where the friendship has to end, right? It's just like, yeah, you know what? Like, I can't get past the fact that there's certain, you know, topics we you know, just are, are, like, are like deal breakers. Okay, well, at least just be honest with that and just don't waste each other's time, right? Um, or at work, uh, you know, I'll give an example there. Like creative, like um, you need healthy conflict, right? Like business is about conflict. Like your current revenue stream and, you know, your current business model will go obsolete at some point. And if you don't have that conflict, when you introduce new revenue streams and new business ideas to keep the, keep the company viable, if you don't have that conversation, your company will die, right? And people don't realize the long-term cost of not addressing the conflict, right? Um, Intel is a classic example. They used to be in memory chips. And then, you know, when they started to get into microprocessors and the CEO then was like seeing this pushback from people like, no, like even though we're losing ground in the memory chips, no, this is what Intel's about. And he's like, I can't, I can't straddle two fences because if I do that, the company will die. And, you know, if they fired me and brought in my replacement, what would he do? And that's what gave him the clarity to realize, oh, they're going to go with the, they're going to go with the microprocessors. So it's like, well, why do why do I have to get fired for this to be realized? Let me just do it myself, save this job, save the company. Guess what? You know, worked worked out pretty well for him. Yeah, yes, it did. And yeah. uh, I, I wrote down a couple of things there. Great points. The first being the question, you know, is this fight worth? And then sometimes the answer might be yes. So we're in a conflict, and it's like, yeah, we have to talk about this because if we don't. We're going to have that situation with the with the boy and the girl who can't go out for for greater reasons. Yeah, we have to talk about this. Yeah. Um, but the other also being, you know, business is about conflict, and you know, back to people pleasing and everyone's like us. That's a that's a good and a fine starting point a lot of the times. But it's business because there's competing interests and there's companies trying to get ahead, and people don't like change. So when you're trying to kind of be the the leader the person in charge of a group like this you're going to face conflict whether or not you have the best intentions whether or not you want everyone to get along because it is going to be a an environment where there is competing uh, if not mindsets at least i want it, i don't want things to change things are good today i don't need i don't need things different or difficult so a uh, really good example for that and kind of uh, walking us through now uh, changing gears a minute before we re recorded we talked about uh a, a project that you worked on with uh, a, a mutual, uh, I guess we'll call him a colleague of ours, but uh, why don't you tell us about uh, about the book, The uh, Secrets of Next Level Entrepreneurs? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's such a it's such a blessing and a, and a gift to be able to appear on podcast with co-authors for this book. So yeah, I, I met Alex Brookman through an, another podcast host, actually, Angelina Carlton. And uh, yeah, Alex, after I we did a, a mutual session together uh, to raise some money for a great cause. He invited me to say, "Hey, Jerry, you know, we we want someone to contribute to our, our leadership anthology for entrepreneurs, and so uh, I want you to, to put together a chapter on conflict resolution for the secrets of next level entrepreneurs book." How we do it, and so yeah, I get to share some of my some of my most poignant and painful stories, both from <laughs> personal and others, uh, to show, hey guys, you know what? Uh, I think of a quote from one of my favorite show war shows, Warrior, where uh, one of the characters goes, be grateful for your pain. It means you're still alive. And this is one of those moments where, you know, when you have to evict a roommate, right? That's, that's a fun, that's a fun one to dangle. And a, a couple others where you just realize, hey, um, sometimes experts mean you just failed at it more than other people, but it's still useful. So, uh, yeah, the book was originally self-published opportunity and we sunk in a good everyone's chipped in a little bit of cash to try to make it go and then for some reason uh wiley picked up the book and so now uh yeah it's being distributed all over the world through wiley as of march well the reason being it's it's a well-written book with a, a lot of uh great minds coming together that's why it is, is published by wiley so we'll definitely include the uh link to the book in the show notes alex was a wonderful guest and uh 
it's it popped up and said, well, of course it makes sense. Uh, Jerry's got a great story. Alex looking for uh, great stories to tell. It only makes sense that they've uh, come together in, in this book. So a uh, uh, very small world there. Um, and the one thing that kind of popped into my mind, though, as you were talking about uh, sharing uh, your, your your conflict resolution secrets, is that uh, sometimes people will avoid conflict by, as we hinted on with the Intel story, by not taking chances, by not pushing the envelope, by kind of embracing the status quo and almost celebrating. It's like, yeah, I don't get into to arguments, or I, I don't, and it's and that's a bad thing. And I think that that's that's something I want to get across here that. Uh, avoiding conflict or just sticking to situations that don't result in any conflict is really a stagnation of, of where we are. And it's going to be, if not impossible, quite difficult to uh, improve on any situation or more likely things are going to change without your okay. And you're going to be in a much worse position. Um, so I was wondering, do you get uh, any kind of pushback with why do we have to, we talked a little bit about proactivity, but you know, things are great now. Why do I need to worry about this? Or I can just keep doing what I'm doing, you know, the quote unquote steady Eddie, and I don't have to, uh, I don't have to change anything. I don't have to worry about this difficult conversation. Why are you making me do this? Yeah, believe me, Mike, I, I've been in plenty of situations where I've tried to chase people down and they just keep finding ways to just jump back 50 feet where it's like, no, nope, I can just block your phone number. I can just not respond to your email. I can move to another city. I don't know. Right. It's just, I can go to another church or, and it's, and it's, and it's tough because what's even, what's a little more frustrating is I can see myself, my former self in, in their actions, right. Where it's just like, Oh, people are upset with me. Okay. Let me just, so let me just run from everything. And then you realize that running from the challenge doesn't help you overcome. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's tough when people are just like, if you, you'd never expect that success would be your, your greatest enemy to growth. Uh, but that's exactly it. And if you aren't getting in this habit of being iterative and continuing to get outside your comfort zone, even just slightly, just say, Hey, let me test something. Let me keep, let me, let me enjoy experimentation a little more when it comes to trying out new activities or foods or, you know, like approaches to conversation, right? Let me, let me get better at listening. Let me, let me try visiting a new country, right? And just getting you, getting that humility, the habit of humility, maybe is the phrase I'll use for right now, is recognizing, hey, you know what? I understand that this is honestly, Mike, that I haven't said this on a lot of podcasts. This is, everything in this world is temporary, right? Like, if there's anything the pandemic taught us, especially not to bring that any more than we have to, but like your world will get disrupted. Like I just listened to a great session on innovation and it's like, if you don't learn to disrupt, you will be disrupted. And, and that's, and that's not to like be a curmudgeon, but just to get people in the habit of recognizing, yes, comfort is only going to go so far. Please enjoy it. If you have it, great. And Right. Don't sit. Don't don't soak yourself in the pool to the point where you get all prudent. Like you have to get out of the water at some point to like dry off and then you know, try. To so yeah, it's a d- difficult visual, but yes, you are. You're right about that. <laughs> um, I, I like the the former self because I, I thought uh, I all this whole conversation. I thought somewhat selfishly of myself when I went from that team. Team, you know, high achieving team member to manage, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I liked it when everybody liked me every day. Now I have a, a conversation I would like to not have, but this is now my job. And it was, I was terrible at it. And it's something that I'm still continuing to learn. Um, but what it made me think of is it's important to be prepared and to have um, kind of the, the frameworks in mind and to have, I, here's where I think the conversation is going to go. But I found both personally and from talking to others, sometimes the preparation can psych you out or you can think it's going to go way worse than it actually does. And it's like, well, it's, it went so bad in my mind. I don't even want to have this conversation because it's going to go so bad. But <laughs> yeah. most of the time it actually doesn't. You know, it's, it's man, I thought that would be worse. And that's what happens. Uh, so how do you kind of balance that? Yes, being prepared is important, but you can't psych yourself out to avoid making that call or having that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Great, great point to emphasize because, yeah, like, what yeah if you think of everything that could go wrong you're gonna be like oh <laughs> no, let me just not do it um yeah the concept of book ending has has come up uh several times in coaching conversations where it's like okay what what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario right and so we can we realize okay let me balance that optimism and realism where maybe you pick the most 
you know, likely three things to come up that you know they're going to be obstacles, right? The concept of a pre-mortem is not meant to uh, deter you from doing something unless it, you, know, you realize, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm just, that's too big a cost for me to do. But to recognize, hey, um, the pre-mortem in, implies that you can overcome the obstacle. And I think that's the difference is just to realize, hey, you know what, okay, I, I think there's a way that, to overcome this. Even if it, I don't have to come up with the idea, that's the, that's the cheat, right? I don't have to come up with how to overcome, like my own strategy to overcome this. Like I can ask friends who have been through similar, similar situations, right? Hey, ask for help. <laughs> there's, there's not, that's not cheating, right? Uh, the other angle is to realize, hey, you know what, even if like plane crashes, right, the black boxes, we always have to pull that out, we can always learn and grow and just like, th this is not final unless you want it to be right. Uh, failure is not final unless you choose to say, you know what, I'm just not going to communicate. And that's okay. Sometimes you do have to move on. And that's a case by case basis. But I mean, I'll go back to my evicting roommate example, right? The first couple of times it was like, I would gingerly put the eviction notice door the letter on his door I just hoped that he read it and then at some point uh, I figured out that I realized he kept as long as he would give me vague promises he felt like if he could just give me vague promises that all oh, the money would even though it's late he'll he'll keep giving me chances um, he would never actually pay and he wouldn't actually kick me out and so when I told him at some point that you know if you do get any money uh, use it to cover rent at your next place of residence only then did he actually start packing his boxes Right. And I wouldn't have found that out unless I just kept not just like battering the ram until like the wall breaks. It is like, OK, let me take a different angle. Let me look at this really closely. OK, let me try this angle. Let me try that angle. And then eventually um, I closed every door. I was able to close every door. And, uh, don't worry, guys. I, I wasted a lot of time, like just like dreading having this conversation. So, uh, like I said, I'm not I'm not this artful dodger that avoided all the you know making mistakes. I'm just saying I I I went through the mud. It came out on the other side stronger. So if you're willing to go through the mud with me, you know I'll help you. Maybe not get some money, but you know you'll get there. I, I'm glad you said the you know gets not get so muddy and, and the failure part. That especially when you are dealing with things like difficult conversations, growth, leadership. It's one of those things that it is not a six hour course. It is not, I, I read this awesome book this weekend and I'm good now. It's, it's, it's a never ending journey. It is hard. It is going to, there's times you're going to take those two step backs, but man, I thought I had this figured out. I did not. He's still in there. I can't get him. I can't get him to move out. I'm not sure what to say. Uh, so that, that when you, when you add the stories to two of the frameworks, it makes it real and it makes it realize that I can, I can get better at this, but I'm probably going to have to keep working on it for a really long time. And then even when I do, something's going to change and I still have to keep working at it. So uh, thank you for keeping it, keeping it real as, as you describe it there. Um, somehow, Jerry, we are already at time. Uh, where can our listeners find you or uh, uh, kind of connect if they want to uh, hear more or uh, get to get to know you a little bit better? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, the, the, I offer a free guide on the five-step framework I mentioned earlier through my website, adaptingleaders.com forward slash guide. Uh, adaptingleaders.com is the base website. You can schedule a complimentary 30-minute call. Just you know, tell me what you're working on. Check out the free blog and yeah, or the guide. Uh, yeah, that you can connect with me on LinkedIn. But all the goodies and all the free, all the all the fun stuff to get you going is at adaptingleaders.com. Perfect. So we will post that along uh, with the the book link in the show notes. Um, I think we did a decent job. I mean, I jump around way too much. But uh, is there anything I didn't ask that I probably should have, Jerry? I think I think uh, I think this was a treat, you know, just being able to just jump around and go off on some fun tangents, and we uncovered some things I haven't mentioned in other podcasts. So you know, you know, kudos to you. For I was gonna say I'll terms. I'll take it as a compliment. I'm not sure I believe you that uh, <laughs> I hit all the uh, high notes, but no, I, mean, I will take. I would fine. No, I mean, if I if I were to mention and end on a note, and just uh, this is what what helped me was just recognize, hey, uh, shift from oh I could never get good at this to well what if I could because you know as soon as you give yourself permission uh to get better at something uh you don't know it says you have to be the best at it but you can always get better and uh, when i saw conflict resolution as not as a fixed quality an innate quality that either i had or i didn't and a skill that could be uh, improved and refined next thing you know um, now people are asking me for advice and i never would have expected well, that really is a, and I'm going to highlight that because that's an awesome point. That is, well, it does. It, 
it's not static. What if it was this way? Or what if it worked out this way? Or I don't have to be this level of whatever it is that I'm trying. What if I was a little bit better? What if I was 2% better? And what if I could get there? That's that's really a great mindset. And that, that is the perfect place to end. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. I, I do look forward to doing this again. And uh, until then, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike.